It's a brand new week. Um, I'm being air bombed by what I think are barn swallows. So if I cut and run, look at this. These skies are filled with these little stealth bombing birds. You see those things? Anyway, so if I turn and run, you'll know what's up. What a weekend we had. I hope you guys had a great weekend as well. It's a brand new week. Come on, let's not get those Monday blues. This is Pray First, and I'm Doug. And it's where we give God the very first of our day, the very first of our week, the very first of everything we wake up in the morning. Hashtag live if you're joining us live. Hashtag record if you're joining us recorded. Uh, this is my last day off on my extended uh, memorial, I mean, 4th of July weekend. And, uh, woo, <laughs> you can't tell they're sleepy in my eyes, but I did have a great week. I hope you had a great 4th of July. I know we saw each other on Friday and I asked you, did anybody lose any digits? You know, just kidding. I didn't or singe any hair. Um, where do you watch fireworks? Do you watch fireworks? Do you buy fireworks? Hashtag yup, yup. If you do, uh, we're going to continue today talking about some stuff, but I just wanted to share with you something. Uh, as you guys are all getting in here and you know, I'm checking out these stealth bombing birds and make sure they don't eat my head. Um, I want to show you on last night, I'm a part of several organizations and different, you know, things. I, I like new things. I like different things. I like lots of things. Um, we do something called the Soto Pursue. Uh, so if your church is out there and maybe you're thinking about what is that niche that your community needs? Um, Anything we do at Cross Point, I want folks to know that we'll share it, guys. All of our churches are in this together, okay? Uh, just because the name of your church is different, it does not make your church different. We're all part of the same, you know, body of Christ. So if you're wondering, what is that niche in your community that your church could identify and, um, and do something significant? Uh, what I'm finding is that niche in our community is single adults. Singles. Um, our churches are very, 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 very family oriented, which is not a bad thing. It's, you know, it's a good thing. But a lot of times it leaves singles feeling excluded, uh, uncomfortable, uh, not in a good tension uncomfortable. I'm talking about it's, it's like they don't exist or like they're not, you know, participating or becoming a part of. Uh, your singles in your community really, really need you. They need your church. They they need positive encouragement. Uh, so what we do is we have something called the Soto Pursue, pursuing God, becoming the one we want, the one we're looking for to be, <laughs> so that we're not out there just searching for somebody to meet our needs. We're, we're making ourselves ready. You know, singles are making themselves ready. So we had a good time at that last night. Uh, what we do is we have a regular church service, um, separate from all our other church services, and we worship and we have the word, and then we have about an hour of fellowship and fun we do it on our back lawn. Last night we had a Kona food truck. We had pinwheel sandwiches. We had games. We had prizes, Starbucks cards. We threw water balloons. I got soaking wet. Uh, so it's a good time. Also, last night, big day yesterday, I preached four times, so my voice is a little shaky this morning. But also last night, uh, our Pray First family uh, gathering met in Olive Branch. Now, that's a group of people from Pray First who meet and discuss the topics that we talk about here on Pray First. If you're out there and you're part of a Pray First Family Fellowship, I want you to hashtag HOLLA. That's H-O-L-L-A. If you're out there and you're part of a, you know, Pray First Family Fellowship, I want you to hashtag HOLLA. So last night in Olive Branch, uh, 19 people got together, and I'm not gonna show you all the pictures, but I am gonna show you, I think one, if I can find it of the family fellowship. Ah, I'm showing you everything but that, aren't I? Here we go. I wanna show you one your community. You can do that where you live. You know what? Get together, friends, family. Um, having internet fellowship is important, but man, getting together is equally as important. So let's jump in right now. So I just wanna set a shout out to the holla holla folks. I see you, Randy. I see you, Mike. I see you, Barbie. If I miss some others, I'm sorry. Uh, Sherry, you were part of the Pray First Fellowship yesterday. Fantastic. Uh, Charles Woodard. All right, so let's, we got to get into today. <clears throat> We've been discussing this comment made by Karen Armstrong, who wrote the book Case for God. 
and our responsibility to have a faith that is growing, a mature faith. You guys, we have a responsibility to have a mature faith. I think we've confused, what's up Jordan Thompson? I think we've confused a childlike faith with childhood faith. Faith should mature because as we grow and as our adult experiences don't match our Sunday school stories, a lot of times it will chip away at our faith and it will make our faith seem, hashtag seem, irrelevant. Here's how Karen Armstrong in The Case for God put it. Many of us have been stranded with an incoherent concept of God. We learned about God about the same time as we were told about Santa Claus. But while our understanding of the Santa Claus phenomenon evolved and matured, our theology remained somewhat infantile. Not surprisingly, when we attain intellectual maturity, many of us rejected the God we had inherited and denied that he even existed. I want you to understand that for a growing adult, quite often, handing them a book or telling them the Bible says is not a good starting point for faith because they don't share that faith in that book that you have. So Paul teaches us how to do this in the book of Acts. Book of Acts chapter 17, I've already read most of it. I'm gonna pick up where we left off. I'm just gonna read you a few, I'm gonna kind of graze through this a little bit to get you back to where we are today. Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, goes into Athens, Greece, and he's greatly distressed that he sees so many idols. And they're worshiping the idol Zeus, and they're worshiping Poseidon, and they're worshiping Ares, and they're worshiping all these idols. They had hundreds of idols. Because they, they did not, they were not the Hebrews that had the Egyptian experience, okay? They, they were not brought out of captivity. You see, oftentimes we don't think about that. It wasn't the whole world that was in captivity to Egypt. The Egyptians themselves were not in captivity to Egypt. It was not the Grecians in captivity to Egypt. Much of the world was not in captivity, so they didn't have the experience of Moses. They didn't have the experience of uh, you know Pharaoh and the plagues. They didn't have the experience of the Red Sea crossing. They didn't have the experience of wandering in the wilderness, being given the Ten Commandments. They'd never been given any commandments by Jehovah. They had never you know, witnessed the golden calf and coming into the promised land and fighting and all these things. So these Athenians in Greece uh, did not share the faith of Paul the Apostle, but they were still searching for God because there's something inside of everyone there's a God-shaped hole, I think it was maybe Rebecca St. James used to sing. There's a God-shaped hole in all of us and a searching heart that's seeking or something like that. And if I just got those lyrics right, that was like prophetic because I didn't listen to her and I don't remember that. But anyways, there is that inside of us. So Paul doesn't go in there and just start ripping them for their faith because they had never signed up for the standard of faith that get it <laughs> yeah, I want to get it all right uh, wow they had never signed up for the standard of faith that you know the Jews had and they had not seen Jesus Christ resurrection they weren't there they were in another country they were on the you know northern side of the Mediterranean Sea they were way far away from this and there wasn't any action news out there on the scene and there wasn't any Twitter out there tweeting they did not know if they'd heard some things, it still wasn't relevant to them because that was for someone else. Kind of like in the Athens we live in today. If we're going to go into Athens, we can't take a book that's irrelevant to them and talk to them about our childhood faith. We've got to talk to them about a mature faith. You say, well, why is it even our responsibility? Well, the last thing Jesus tells his disciples, which you and I want to be, which you and I are, is go ye into all the world and Preach the gospel. Tell the good news. Go into where the, all the world, where those people are that don't share our faith significance or whatever. He also tells us to go out into the streets and the highways and compel people to come in that his house might be full. So, you know, churches get into this thing all the time about, do numbers matter? Shouldn't it matter more if people are healthy? Or should it matter more that, you know, we have a bunch of people? Um, why do we have to choose one or the other? Why can't we have both? 
why can't we meet together in fellowships? We call them churches, but they're actually fellowships and buildings of believers. And then go out into the world and make a significant difference in people's lives without beating them with the Bible and without being so exclusive that we can't touch them because our holy hands has been down to the synagogue of the, you know, the steepled church. And we 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 sang from the holy hymnal, and we've heard from the holy voice of the holy man, and we sat in the holy building, and we read from our holy text, and you know that's that's kind of like the good Samaritan thing. The Pharisees were just too good to touch anybody because they were going to church. So I want us to come to a place where we understand that every day that we live as a disciple is significant. That as we go to school, as we go out into our community as we go shopping, as we do mundane day-to-day -day activities, that we are representatives of Jesus Christ in our communities and our neighborhoods, not with an exclusivity that people can't share, you know, what we have. And we go to the right church, and I know y'all go to that old-timey church, but we go to the new church that has the lights and the smoke and uh, the Disney World, you know, for children. Come on, guys. We, we, we've got to get along. Jesus said very clearly that by this one another and all God's people said so Paul is looking at these you know these altars and he's saying you know I see that you got an altar to everybody you even have an altar to the unknown God so you guys are kind of guessing about your faith and they're like yeah we're doesn't get out his book he doesn't get out anything because these people do not have a New Testament and they don't care about the Old Testament he begins talking to them and not beating on them, and he says, I'm going to appeal to you to your faith because I see that you're religious people. People of Athens, he says in verse 22 of Acts chapter seven, uh, 17, I see in every way that you're religious. Everybody's telling me I'm breaking up, so I may be too far away from my internet, so I'm going to pick this show up and go on the road. He says, I see that you are very religious, for as I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. So guys, look, I see that you want to know God. You're trying to figure out God, but you just hadn't figured him out yet, so I'm going to help you with that. I walked around, I carefully looked, I even found this altar with the inscription, unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm coming to proclaim to you. I'm going to make the unknown God known to you. And then listen what he does. The God who made the world, he began to describe this God that he knew. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples. I want you to hashtag no temples. He's describing them this because the culture he was from kept building temples. He's describing this to them because he recognized that the Athenians were building the Parthenons and they were building, you know, temples to God. And Paul says, my God won't fit in a temple. He won't fit in a building. Uh, when my God meets with us, he tells us to go out, to get out, to go make a difference, go live among the people. Go compel them to come in. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go out of here and go reach people. He says, my God, he, he, he won't fit in a temple. If your God fits in a temple, you've got an itty-bitty God. He is not served. This is beautiful. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Don't we spend most of our time teaching one another to serve God? What, what, what is that? I think it has been a distraction that we have taught each other to serve God when God so clearly and very well articulates that he wants us to serve one another, to serve mankind, to serve people, to serve the poor, to serve the widow, to serve the orphan, to serve uh, your enemies, to serve, you know, listen, he says, quit putting God in a box. Man, God won't fit in your box. If, if that's your God, he's probably one of these other statues. But this unknown God that you're worshiping over here, Athens, he won't fit in that. And he's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Rather, he himself is a giver. Hashtag giver. He himself is a giver. He gives life to everyone and breath. And then he goes on and says, and just in case you're wondering what else God gives, he gives us everything else. Verse 26, from one man, he's now talking about Adam, and he's also talking about Jesus in a parallel. 
From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and their history and their boundaries and their land. In other words, this God, this unknown God you've got up here on this little thing that can't live inside of you know, a temple and he's not made with human hands, he's not just the God of the Hebrews and he's not just the God of the Jews and he's not just the God of, of those in the Arab world. He's not just the God of those in Nazareth and Bethlehem. He marked out the times and the dates and the territories and he marked out the borders and of every nation. He says he marked out their appointed times in history, their boundaries in their land. Listen, God has the boundaries of future nations already drawn because he's bigger than today. He's bigger. Come here, come here, come here. This is, this is shocking to the American church that I'm talking to for the most part. <clears throat> God is bigger than the borders of the United States of America. And God also has seen those borders redrawn. Come here, come here. God is not limited by the shape of your country right now. And what I mean by shape is its borders, its divisions, its drawing points. God is bigger than that. He is larger than that. Athens, listen, I know that you guys think Rome is forever, but God has a, he has an expiration date on the, the totality of Rome. America, I know you think that you're the biggest thing that's ever existed, but you're 243 baby years old. God is bigger than that. He's been here longer than that. He will supersede it. He will exceed it. He will go beyond that border. Listen to this. Listen to this. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Seek him in religion. Reach out means to stagger around in the dark looking for a light switch. He says, I can tell by all of your idols that you have out here that you're staggering around in the dark and you're looking for a light switch. I can tell that you're walking around an unfamiliar room and you've got your hands on the wall and it's dark where you are and it's scary where you are and you feel small and you feel insignificant and you feel like there's got to be something bigger. There's some, got to be something broader. There's a design. There's a designer. There's a creation. There's a creator. There's a plan. There's a planner. And you're out here searching in the dark and you've got your hands going down a wall frantically looking for just the smallest light. He says the light is over there. The switch is over there at the un known altar, but I'm going to make him known to you. If you reach out and find him, though he is not far from any of us because he's with us, God is all around us. He's in everything. When you look at a beautiful painting and you see the artist work, the you see that beautiful painting. You see that work. There was an artist behind that beautiful work. And though the artist is not in the painting, you can see characteristics of him in the painting. Stop worshiping the painting. Stop worshiping the tree. Stop worshiping the sun. Stop worshiping the water. Stop worshiping an animal. You are looking for something. And guys, don't, don't feel bad. You, you didn't know, and you knew you didn't know. You have an unknown altar over there. You've been worshiping to the best of your ability, but you didn't know, okay? Here's what you didn't know. You were worshiping the art. You did not know the artist. I'm going to tell you the artist cannot be kept in a museum. Churches. He is bigger than your nation's borders. He supersedes your activities and timelines. Life is but a mist and a vapor. I'm going to tell you today about this unknown God. He's not far from us. He's still with us. He's with us. He's not out there, some God that cannot, you know, understand what you're going through. He is a God who has walked the face of the earth. I know men and women who ate and saw him, walked on the water at the command of his voice, came out of the tomb when he did. This God is not far from you, Athens. You're very close to the light switch. Keep searching. Keep looking. You don't have to accept my word today, and I don't have a Bible to say the Bible says, and I can't quote from Matthew or Luke. Matter of fact, Luke is sitting right here beside me, and he's writing now what I'm saying right now. Some of you, listen to what he appeals to. He doesn't quote the Bible in a world that did not have the Bible. For in him, listen to what he quotes. There's quotation marks on Acts chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live, we move, and have our being. And if you're from like the 90s, you know a worship song. In him we live and move and have our being in him we live and move and have our being make a joyful noise singing to the lord 
Tell him about your something. Again, this is prophetic because I barely remember this stuff. Didn't you know that song? Uh, you thought you were quoting the Bible. In him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. You weren't quoting the Bible. You're quoting something that is included in our Bible, but that was actually written by a Greek poet. Paul appeals to the culture because everyone there was familiar with this artist's work. Everyone was familiar with this poet's work. So he quotes, For in him we live, and he's actually talking about Zeus. For in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. He says, You have attributed that piece of the, the tapestry, that piece of the artwork, to Zeus. Mm -mm. You were actually talking about our Father God. You were actually talking about Jehovah. You were actually talking about Jesus. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Whew. We are the children of God. Therefore, since we're God's offspring, and he goes into this thing, so I'm not going to go there right now. How do we reach Athens, a world around us that does not you know, recognize the book? does not recognize the book of faith. Well, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians, this same author, Paul, who talked to the people of Athens and what he said, and then I'm going to pray for you. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Even though, Paul says, I am free from the demands and expectations of everyone. <sighs> I love that right there. Whoa! Even though. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone. I have voluntarily become voluntarily become a servant to any and all. I'm free of the demands and the commands. I am free. Everything is legal and lawful for me, but all things aren't beneficial for me. I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone. I have voluntarily become a servant. How many of y'all is that your faith walk? Have you ever felt like in your faith that you are enslaved and you are tied down and you are... That's not faith of Jesus Christ. How many of you have done that with your church or with your community? Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralist, loose living immoralist, the defeated and the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and try to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all of this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about the message. I wanted to be in on the message. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray you bless this Monday, bless this week, bless my people so that's out there and the ones they'll share this with and get this out to and the churches they'll share this with and the ideas they'll come up from this. Father, I just pray that you bless them with a good week, health, uh, joy. Father, that you would bring some clarities to some areas that seem cloudy to them today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Hit some hearts, hit some likes, hit some hashtags. Like, shared, and recorded. I'll see you guys later. I love y'all. Hey, this is the Areopagus that Paul stood on. That's Athens. This is the rock he stood on and talked to the Athenians about in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. My buddy Cole Catledge went to Athens a couple of weeks ago and brought me this back. Um, they actually have the message of Paul written in Greek up on the wall. This isn't in the Bible. <laughs> uh, this, this, this isn't on the wall because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible because it's on this wall. It happened. It's history. Doesn't take a lot of faith to know it's history. Bye, guys. See y'all later.